Hi guys, and welcome back to my channel. Today we will once again be looking at paintings in the Louvre. Last we left off in, I believe, the 1400s or 1500s. So let's see if we can find our place. This is around where we stopped. Let's go ahead and start with Alessandro Filippi called Botticelli. Only fragments remain of the wall paintings discovered in 1873 in a loggia at the Villa Lemmi near Florence, possibly a former residence of the Torna Boni family. The two pictures, a young woman receives gifts from Venus and the Three Graces, and a young man is greeted by the liberal arts, were acquired badly damaged for the Louvre in 1882. And were originally accompanied by a third. There is no certainty about their relationship. They have a freedom and an informality that set them apart from Botticelli's other mythologies and an atmosphere that is evidently affectionate yet difficult to construe. So here at the bottom, we have a young woman receives gifts from Venus and the Three Graces. And this is a fresco. Here are the graces. And then over here, we have a young man is greeted by the liberal arts. The author says, They may have been marriage pictures, but the identity of the couple remains in doubt. In one of the pictures, Venus and the three graces appear to a young woman who already holds gifts. In another, a young man is presented by a similar Venus to personifications of the liberal arts. These pictures do not seem far removed from the spirit of Botticelli's more famous mythologies, the panels in which love in the person of Venus is seen as the teacher of all the arts. In this respect, the paintings from the Villa Lemmy spell out in more explicit terms the very conception of classic divinity which may underlie all Botticelli's mythologies. Here's the other painting that we've discussed. Okay, so on the left is Portrait of a Man. And on the right is the Virgin and Child with John the Baptist. This is such a lovely piece. This one is by Carlo Di Bracesco. And again, like I say in all of my videos, I don't really know how to pronounce a lot of these names, so please correct me. <laughs> and I'm sorry. But I'll try my best. Um, yeah, this piece is The Annunciation with Saints, and it's a triptych, which means there are three panels. Here's a leapy piece. Three scenes from the story of Virginia. So in this one image, there are three scenes. I guess one scene is back here too. So in my mind, one of the really cool things about having art books is these full color prints because in a print like this which is a really high quality one you can see so many little details and I know that you could probably google 
a high res photo of this painting. Although it's interesting, um, copyright for photographs of public domain works is kind of a complicated area, <laughs> but that's it for another day. But there's so many details in this piece that you can appreciate looking at it like this. Like just the, just the little variations in skin tone and I think getting particularly this girl and this woman getting that look of, especially here, just getting that look of youth is so difficult. And it just looks so realistic. And over here as well. And look over here at the... I shouldn't warp the image, but... I mean, I know that these artists probably had apprentices to help them with some of this work, but Look at all these delicate little strands. I don't know what this is, but this meat that he's carving up. Or even like this piece of bread. Or this glass of water. And then... I don't know if this is meant to be an actual garden or a mural. But all the flowers here. Not really cool. Okay. Michael Sitel. Coronation of the Virgin. And then Juan de Flant. Flandes. Christ and the Woman of Samaria. A bit of a rougher texture here. It's interesting to see. Dark shadows. Though it's always hard to know how much of it is just age. Here we have Lorenzo di Credi. Let's read a little bit about what the author has to say. The first sign of that explosion of ideal art, raised to a superhuman pitch of perfection, which we call the High Renaissance, was the appearance of a wonder boy, Leonardo da Vinci, in the Florentine workshop of Andrea del Verrocchio. Verrocchio. <laughs> I think it's Verrocchio. I'm not positive. This capable team of artists could make a good fist at any of the image crafts in a rather dryly decorative way, but the natural son of a notary from the little town of Vinci was something else altogether, I'll say. That sign that something quite outside the range of routine efficiency was afoot was the introduction among the works of the studio of figure types of extraordinary, rather self-conscious beauty, angels in particular, an enunciation and a baptism each included one angel, idealized with seductive perfection and rendered still more conspicuous by the demure modesty that does not conceal awareness of the attention that beauty attracts. Each angel bore himself like a future star in a first film role. <laughs> it's funny. The ideal beauty of the young Leonardo's angels almost immediately extended to all the pictorial forms touched by his hand. The paintings undertaken by his fellow pupil, Lorenzo di Credi, at once began to show a kind of distinction that the presence of an extraordinary genius conferred. The altarpiece that was commissioned for Pistoia, among others, included a Pridella panel, the Annunciation, that showed not only figures of uncommon perfection, but a consistent and ingeniously enchanting design quite beyond the range of Lorenzo who was an efficient and intelligent painter without a sign of magic in him. Ooh, 
It's rough. This author follows the Louvre authorities in leaving the question open of the authorship of the Annunciation, although Lorenzo di Credi was clearly responsible for the rest of the altarpiece. Leonardo's pictures were never again capable of being mistaken for anyone else's. Wow, that's kind of a badass line, huh? <laughs> it's like, don't worry about it. You'll know when it's my, st my stuff. It's pretty cool. Okay, so this is another piece by Lorenzo di Credi. I think what I'm understanding this to mean is that they were apprentices together um, for Andrea di, di Verrocchio. And um, Da Vinci kind of blew Di Credi out of the water. <laughs> this is my understanding. This is another one of his pieces. I think it's quite beautiful. I love the rendering of the fabric here. It's so delicate. And, uh, and on her headscarf. This one is the Virgin and Child with St. Julian and St. Nicholas of Meyer. Some different sort of compositions here. Um, this one is Luca Signorelli, the birth of St. John the Baptist. From the 1400s, I'm assuming. And then over here is Domenico Girlandao. Girlandio? Girlandio? I don't know. <laughs> and this is the visitation. So this is interesting. Um, this looks like maybe a okay. So it's a poly polyptych. So there's like multiple panels, and then on the left is Saint Augustine, and on the right is Saint Peter. And kneeling in the foreground are the donors, to the painting, or to the church or wherever, and it's from the Charter House of Pavia of one point perspective here. Very uh, affectionately placed their hands on the shoulders of these donors. Okay, Cosimo Tura, a Pieta here. St. Anthony of Padua reading. And then Bartolomeo Vivar Vivarini, St. John of Capistrano. These are interesting looking. De Roberti, De, Robert, De Roberti, I haven't seen an, an apostrophation like that before. Oh my, I'll just see this little guy down here. This is St. Michael, I guess, fighting a demon. And this is St. Apollina, the virgin and child between St. John the Baptist and St. Anthony Abbot. And this is also known as the Virgin at the Fountain. This is, um... Andreo Mattegna and Giovanni Bellini. The dream of antiquity to which the art and life of Andrea Mantegna, Mantegna, is that right? Were devoted, took the form first and foremost of an infatuation with stone. Mantegna's work is rarely without a note of sentient humanity and compassion rises from its stoic dignity. At the same time, his brother-in-law, Giovanni Bellini, was moving in the opposite direction, toward the most delicate and melting expression of the tenderest themes. Wow. <laughs> it's not quite a style of writing in this book. It was Bellini who was most quickly abandoned, or sorry, who most quickly abandoned, the inflexibility of tempera. It's a style of paint 
when Antonella de Messina, de Messina, da Messina, <laughs> introduced the Flemish admixture of oil and the attendant fluent softness of transition to the styles of Venetian painting in 1475, the same year in which Bellini painted the portrait of a man. In old age, when Bellini shared the warmth and poetry of the new generation, Mantegna's intellectual grandeur was instead affected by pedantic elaboration. So here's another Saint Sebastian. Here is virgin and child surrounded by six saints and Gian Francesco Il Gonzaga known as Madonna of Victory. This elaborate kind of altar here with all the fruits. And here is portrait of a man. Another portrait of a man and then Calvary. And these are 1470s-ish. Vittore Carpaccio. It is commonplace that the deepest theme of Venetian painting is Venice. Yeah, that makes sense. If this is true of any painter, it's true of Carpaccio, the favorite decorator of those charitable confraternities of Venice known as scuole. Carpaccio habitually visualized the places that figure in the lives of the saints as flattering likenesses of Venice or its provinces on the mainland. Certainly Jerusalem, where St. Stephen preached, was imagined as one of the cities of the Veneto, whose buildings climb the foothills of their mountain setting. The sense of place is exquisite, and the tact with which the painter always moderated the paradoxes of perspective to maintain a decorative unity has permanently influenced our view of Venice. The city of marble and the water that gently washes against it, the marine element to which it naturally belongs, has superficially changed since Carpaccio's day. All but one of the schools for which he painted were suppressed by Napoleon in San Giorgio. The most famous of them survived only by appealing to the brother-in-law who was Napoleon's viceroy. The Scuola of St. Stephen, for which St. Stephen preaching at Jerusalem was painted, was near San Stefano in the broad campo, now Morosini, through which everyone passes on the way to and from the Academia Bridge. The sun that shines across the campo bathes the bystanders who collect there in a play of reflected light, not unlike that which Carpaccio imagined on St. Stephen's congregation in Jerusalem. Similarly, a miniature triumphal arch in the middle distance frames a view of the neighborhood with a typically Venetian wit. All right. Um, here's Nerocho di Bartol Bartolomeo di Benedetto di Landi, the Virgin and Child between St. John the Baptist and St. Anthony. And here's um, St. James of the Marsh with two kneeling donors. Oh, look how tiny they are. And over here is Bernardo Parentino, the Adoration of the Magi. That's a fairly uh, common subject. And then down here, Giovanni Battista Cima, and this is the Virgin and Child between St. John the Baptist and St. Mary Magdalene. Andrea Mantegna, Mantegna was a painter ideally suited to the scholarship and taste of Isabella d'Est. Or Isabella d'Este. It's funny because I know, like, depending on the language you pronounce that differently, and I don't know if it's, honestly, I don't know if it's referring to French or Spanish or something else, or Italian. Anyway, when she married Ludovico Gonzaga, the groom's grandfather commissioned Mantegna to decorate the treasure chamber that was also her study at Man Mantua. Later, Isabella is recorded as having asked only that the artist choose an ancient subject with a beautiful meaning. Yet when Perugino was about to contribute, she sent a sketch of her requirements to him. Mantegna's theme in Mars and Venus must have delighted her. The meeting of Mars and Venus by an elevated rustic couch in the presence of Mercury and Pegasus brought together the planetary deities who were in conjunction on her wedding day in February 1490. Oh, she's an astrology girl. We love that. The outcome of the liaison is the harmony Apollo plays on his lyre as the muses dance with gestures of delightful suggestiveness. Oh, this is a very, like, 
spicy piece, I guess. Yeah, Mars, I believe, is the god of war. The Greek god of war. I want to say. It's like some friend added a period to that sentence. We recognize the taste that encouraged a Mantuan humanist to entertain Isabella with correspondence. <laughs> Montaigne's next picture, Minerva chases the vices from the Garden of Virtue, applied mythology to a moralizing theme, and later decorations were increasingly allegorical and didactic. With the impoverishment of the Gonzagas, the collection at Mantua were dispersed. So this top piece is the Mars and Venus piece. Oh, and here's Pegasus. And here's Minerva chases the vices from the Garden of Virtue. Wow, there's some sort of Bosch elements in there. Oh, and here's a um, detail of, I think this is the Muses dancing. Yeah, so it's this portion from Mars and Venus. And this is, um, So it's on canvas. Look at this uh, corner here of this wing. Oh, this is Pegasus' wing. So this is Pietro Venucci called Il Perugino, The Combat of Love and Chastity. Lorenzo Costa, The Reign of Camus. Lorenzo Costa, Allegory of the Court of Isabella Des. And then on the next page, Correggio. On the left, Allegory of the Virtues in Tempera. And on the right, Allegory of the Vices. So this is the virtuous panel this is kind of the sinful panel, I guess. <laughs> little photo bomb. I don't know what you <laughs> I said it before, but I really have no idea about YouTube guidelines. And I don't know if, if they make exceptions when it comes to, you know, art that's 600 years old, but we'll see. A few great mythologies were painted as part of an astrological calendar, or a reasoned program of philosophic and poetic persuasion, like the famous pictures by Tura and Botticelli. But as the Renaissance ascended to its highest level of achievement, most pagan painting was occasional or household painting commissioned as a personal token. Cassone panels decorated the chest installed in a marital chamber, which became an integral part of a great household. These panels usually depicted ceremonious displays of finery, perhaps symbolizing a processional journey through life, but with no more application to the actual, to an actual household than the marriage of Peleus and Thetis. Peleus and Thetis. More intimate and specific was the Desco da Parto, a round panel that was in origin a dish given in celebration or expectation of a birth. The works of the early 16th century were no longer pioneer examples. The picture of Apollo in his naked arrogance triumphing over Marcias in musical competition suggested to 19th century authorities the kind of example that might have been followed in Perugino's workshop by Raphael himself, and in 1850, when it was sold, the picture became the subject of notorious controversy. Apollo in Marcias furnished a study rather than a bedchamber, but the Sienese Judgment of Paris by Benvenuto was surely a marriage picture. I didn't know that about the Cassone thing. Oh, finally, and I think we're ending this chapter with a bang here. Leonardo da Vinci. The Virgin of the Rocks has claims to be among the most significant pictures in Western art, except that its meaning is inscrutable. The Virgin with the Infants, Christ, and St. John the Baptist, in the care of an angel who is as much like a sphinx, detach themselves with problematic clarity from the shadow of a grotto of primeval rock, 
penetrated only by a mysterious vista extending to the dawn of time. Though not large as altar pieces go, it was the biggest picture Leonardo ever finished. It was commissioned in 1483 by the Confraternity of the Immaculate Conception for their altar in San Francesco Grande in Milan and painted when the doctrine of the Immaculate Conception was being promulgated. The confraternity never received the work, which has no relevance to the Immaculate Conception. The angel points to the infant St. John the Baptist, who receives particular favor from the Virgin. One would rather expect this on an altar dedicated to St. John. In place of this work, the confraternity received a version designed by Leonardo, who resolved some of the problems in the first version, such as the conflicting gestures. But apart from a few details, Leonardo left the second version for his disciples, the Preda brothers, to finish. It was bought by an English dealer in 1785 and is now in London. The likeliest explanation of how the 1483 version came uniquely to be finished and then to vanish is that the irresistible Ludovico e Moro made Leonardo an offer he could not refuse, so that the painting could become a fabulous wedding present for Ludovico's niece and the Emperor Maximilian. The picture would thus have passed to Fontainebleau and ended as the French royal collections fortunately did in the Louvre Museum. There it remains, one of the select group of masterpieces that remind us that an indispensable essence of great art is the mystery that is fated to remain unsolved. So this is the piece that's being discussed in that uh, essay. And this is very frequently discussed in art history classes, if you've ever taken one. But it's beautiful, isn't it? And even the smaller parts, like this area back here, which the author describes, um, what did he say? Mysterious vista extending to the dawn of time. Yeah, I like that description. And then here is Portrait of a Lady at the Court of Milan, and this is another very famous work, although I don't imagine that any existing da Vinci pieces are not considered famous, so maybe that's like an arbitrary <laughs> statement. Um, I, like to, I just think about how many magnets we have of whatever piece, and that's my, that's my famous scale, I guess, which I need to update, but, um, I don't, I've, you know, I've been to the Louvre, but I don't know if I've seen this one, it's 80 inches tall, by about 50 inches wide, and so fittingly, oh, and we have one more piece here, what is this face page? I don't know, I, I don't know that it has a uh, attribute it, but I know this is Da Vinci. All right, here we are at um, a broken book. <laughs> um, this book has been retired from a library and has a lot of damage to it. But I explained that in the other one. Um, but uh, thank you guys so much again for taking time out of your day to watch my videos. I really do appreciate it. I know there's a lot to choose from. And uh, thank you for taking a chance on mine. I hope you enjoy. Um, in the next video, we will continue into 1500s towards 1600. Uh, let's see what's in here. So this is probably going to be a lot of Renaissance work. Raphael. Bronzino. But I hope you have a wonderful night, and I will see you next time.